Hello, BookTube. I have to remind myself that these videos, in addition to being Steve streams, and this one is long delayed, we haven't done Steve stream in a long time, are also videos on my channel. They're also sitting there on my channel. You can watch them as a video without watching them as a Steve stream. So I want to say hello, BookTube, and also hello, AuthorTube, even though I don't really know what AuthorTube is and haven't liked at all what I've seen of it <laughs> since I've been researching it in the last couple of weeks. Uh, because I've been thinking a lot, a lot about writing. So this this Steve stream, before it goes off the rails and you start, uh, you know, ask me anything, uh, is going to be a bit about writing. I've been thinking a lot about writing and doing a lot of writing uh, since Camp NaNoWriMo ended in April. And Camp NaNoWriMo in April, for me, Gilroy, my story, was it was a success for me. Which is good, because the last time I tried Camp NaNoWriMo, or NaNoWriMo I felt like I, it was a failure. Even though I finished, I felt like I had failed. I didn't, I, I didn't do what I wanted to do. In Gilroy, I did exactly what I set out to do, but it, it, it didn't satisfy because it wasn't pleasing me. I came to a, a realization about sex scenes in fiction. I came to a realization that they aren't for the writer. They're exclusively working for a living they're exclusively showing up and punching a time clock and doing soulless work at the box factory until you punch out again at least for me maybe there are writers out there in fact i can't help but think now that i think about it that there must be writers out there who absolutely live to write scenes like that but i'm not one of them they brought me very little in the way of writerly enjoyment just the personal in i mean obviously all the writing that you do is for your readers but you have to be involved you have to be enjoying the process i think and it didn't work. And something about Camp NaNoWriMo, Gilroy Rentboy not working in that on that level for me had the opposite effect of what I would think. It, it affected me in the opposite way. It made me want to do more writing in addition to the writing that I already do. For those of you who are new to the channel, and I don't think there are any, <laughs> it looks to me like YouTube is doing another tinkering with the algorithm. A lot of channels that I've seen, not all, but a lot of channels that I've seen, their their subscriber count has stalled almost to a halt. And more importantly, remember the last time there was a, a change in the algorithm, people's subscriber counts just started plummeting. Mine as well started plummeting. I started getting me down to reasonable numbers. <laughs> but this time, I get the strong impression that the tinkering that YouTube is doing is with view counts instead of subscriber numbers. But either way people would find this in a year or two years for those of you who don't know what i'm talking about i do write for an audience every day <laughs> i write for an audience for a living i am a professional critic but it's not quite the same i mean i have a readership for my reviews for my reviews and also now my column i have a readership that i have built up over years that is dedicated enough to follow me anywhere and they show up in the subscriber numbers, the subscription, the paid subscriptions, the print subscriptions, especially the internet traffic uh, of anywhere where my work goes. I usually warn editors ahead of time, this is going to spike a bit because I'm bringing an audience with me that I have accumulated over years. It just likes the way I write. They like what I write about and they like the way I write. And I know they're out there and I'm immensely grateful for them. Uh, but it's not the same thing as when I mostly write book reviews, if we leave aside my book column for the minute, I, wrote, I mostly write book reviews. And for book reviews, people want a whole bunch of things when they go to a book review. Actually, that's a whole video that I could make is asking what you go to a book review for. But being entertained by the writer, by the writer's own voice, by the writer's own insight, it's not usually something people go to book reviews for. I'm very, very, I'm very honored by the fact that my book reviews are useful to my readers and to readers who aren't part of that core readership the people who find my book reviews tend to find them useful and i'm very grateful for that but it's not the same thing as singing for your supper and i don't do it for the same reasons i i review books i mean my my goal my duty is to you is to the reader but the payoff that i get is to be part of the communal conversation around any given book if I review a new book, like, for instance, today in the mail, I got Emily Wilson's new translation of The Iliad. 
I will certainly review that book somewhere. And there will certainly be a huge multi-voice conversation about that book. And being part of that conversation, not necessarily just being blurbed on the, on the paperback, but being part of that conversation is the personal payoff for me in that kind of writing. There's a duty. I, I, I feel like I should do my duty by my readers, that there should be at least one book reviewer out there who's writing at a reasonable length in a helpful way. Uh, there are plenty. I, I want to be one of those readers, one of those reviewers. But the personal payoff is that. It's being part of the conversation. That's very different from the personal payoff of actually directly entertaining an audience of readers. And I was thinking about that when I was finishing with Camp NaNoWriMo this time around. When I was finishing Gilroy Rentboy, which has a twist at the end, but has nothing to do with the sex scenes that fill the book. Uh, I don't think that it's bad. I don't think it's a, a twist that comes out of nowhere. I don't think that it may, it makes all the sex scenes a waste of time. Uh, and I think the sex scenes got better as I, as I did more of them and got more used to it. But my NaNoWriMo stuff, the more I was thinking about it, the more I was thinking my NaNoWriMo stuff, it, it feels wonderful to be part of the community of NaNoWriMo, but it doesn't go anywhere. No, one, It's not entertaining anyone. No one sees it. And that has me thinking. That has me thinking thoughts about writing that I have not thought in a long, long time. <laughs> in a long, long time. Once upon a time, years ago, a friend of mine had a contract to write a book, a novel that you have heard of, and he couldn't do it. He started, he sketched, he dithered, but he couldn't do it. Now, the reasons were personal. I don't, we don't need to get into them here, but he couldn't do it. And there was money on the line and a reputation on the line, and I helped him a lot. He came over here, we or to the version of here at the time, and we we worked together until his book was written. And when that process was all over, he said, why don't you write for a living? And I said, well, I do write for a living. I, I write book reviews. And he said, why don't you write more for a living? <laughs> why don't you make more money with your writing than you do? You could. Why don't you? Uh, he pointed out that a, a, a book gathering, a book gala, I used to go to those things. I don't anymore. I wouldn't dream of it. But he pointed out that the last time we went to one of those things, we were surrounded by writers who make money with their writing who are far less talented than either one of us. Uh, he was including me. I was very honored by that. And it's got me thinking about writing for money, about writing fiction for money, about self-publishing fiction got me wondering how to do it and where to do it and all the ins and outs. I want so bad. I wish so bad that I could snap my fingers and have a bunch of you over here on Friday nights. It would mean the end of Steve's dreams on Friday nights. But how I wish I could do that. There are probably self-published authors among you that probably have answers or ideas about a lot of this sort of stuff. It, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought that every time I think about writing that kind of thing, writing something that I intend to publish. So not, not a sealed off thing from NaNoWriMo, but something that I intend to publish for the entertainment of an audience that is paying to read it. Every time I think about that, I always think about it in the future. I always think about it as something that I will do eventually when I get all my ducks in the row. But I see firsthand every day, literally every day, the product of people who don't wait and who do have a book out there, and I have to review it. And because I have to review one of those books every single day, I'm well aware of what fly-blown crap most of them are. <laughs> I'd like to think that if I were to do something like that, it wouldn't be crap. And if they can figure out how to do it, if they can do it, I can do it. So I want to, I want to explore this, and I don't know... I want to set up a sort of Steve Donahue channel exploratory committee, like I was going to run for president, a, an exploratory committee on how I would do this, and where it would go, what form it would take. I, I don't know. All of a sudden, after Gilroy Rentboy, all of a sudden, when I think about writing, NaNoWriMo doesn't feel enough. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm not asking for an agent or a deal with Houghton Mifflin, all of a sudden I feel like I should be writing this sort of stuff for an audience that will pay to read it. Plus, a young friend of mine said, you know, 
that I am cool enough that I should have a side hustle. I've never had a side hustle. I don't think I ever have. I don't think that I don't consider the work that I do every day to be a main hustle. So having a side hustle seems, ah, uh, what's the matter, baby? Little Bean just came vigorously awake and is now paying close attention to a corner of the room. I wonder what that's all about. Can't be a mouse. <laughs> I don't think she's left any alive. Uh, but anyway, that was how I wanted to start this video, which is going to end at 10 past the hour, as they all do. I wanted to start this by talking about writing. I think my view of writing is changing. I think it, that my time of waiting to change what I do with writing should probably be over. Otherwise, I'll just wait forever. And I, I, I can't, I will lose my ability to mock and needle people who wait forever if I also wait forever. And I don't want to lose that ability, <laughs> especially since I've noticed that since Camp NaNoWriMo, I have been studiously writing every day, fiction, every day. I started with a murder mystery in which my two main protagonists are cops. And uh, a certain person on Voxer told me, squashed that idea, said, no, no. You can't do that. Not in 2023. You can't do that. It, it's it's not going to work. It's not going to work to the, the temporary Band-Aid solution that I came up with was uh, good cops in a system acknowledging that there are plenty of cops that are bad in the same system. And this particular person on Voxer said, no, no, the system is corrupt. You're just going to be ignoring that. In, in a piece of fiction in 2023, if you write that way. And this person also pointed out there are plenty of alternatives to doing that. So I scrapped that idea, even though it had a great opening scene. You might remember, I, I decided I was going to write a murder mystery knowing nothing, just working from the opening scene. Uh, and once I wrote the opening scene, six pages in manuscript, uh, a twist for the middle of the book came to me and it is oh, 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 chef's kiss. It is a great twist. I can figure out a way to use that twist somewhere else. I know that I can. I know that I can, even if I scrap this book. I, so I'm going to scrap this book, but it hasn't stopped the end to write and to write fiction. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking about. That's why this, this video is about writing because I'm thinking about stopping just thinking about writing for publication as opposed to just for NaNoWriMo. I can't believe I'm reaching a point where I'm, I'm saying just NaNoWriMo, but that's what I felt this time around, that I want more. And that it'd be nice if it was money. If there were, as weird as it is, it'd be nice if that was bringing in money as well. Uh, so I, that, that's, oh my God. Oh my God. There's a chat. There's, there's a chat. Uh, Carol, I want to. I don't. I can't scroll up, or I'll boot myself right out of the chat. I think. Uh, Gola Muadib is here. Says hello and happy Friday. Uh, your name, Gola Muadib, reminds me that I have a screener for the next Dune movie that I haven't watched. I really need to get to that. Matt Sheridan says howdy, Steve, and hello to my fellow Donahueites. Uh, Dylan M says hello, Steve. Glad to finally catch one of these live for the first time in a while. It's been a while since I did one. Uh, author tune seems very shallow these days. The best are trying to sell their book rather than provide anything else. That is what I noticed. Split between, well, first of all, 10,000 shorts. But it, of the very few actual videos that I saw, they were split between uh, people giving dumb seminar advice and people trying to sell their wares. With nothing like the community that we have on BookTube. I know that's an overused word, but it's nevertheless true. I tune in to find out what what my what other booktubers are doing. You do too, I'm sure you do. I tune in to find out what they're doing. I tune in to find out what's on their mind or what they've been reading or that sort of thing. The reading is absolutely a linchpin to the whole community, but there's a bunch of other stuff too. And that does not appear, I've not finished exploring, but there does not appear to be an equivalent to that in author two. Maybe it's just another thing. Maybe I'm I'm doing it a disservice by expecting it to be something that it doesn't want to be. But there, I don't find anything other than that. Nothing like this at all. To the point where a few people in the email have been telling me, just make the author tube that you want and people will flock to it. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, Ivu Josu, when talking about Gilroy Rentboy, I believe you mentioned that Tack or Tim or Tech realized the difference between serving others and helping others. I'd like to hear more about that difference. 
Well, yeah, he for the for the huge bulk of the book, he thinks that he is helping others when really he's not. Really, he's not. He's giving them what they want, but that's not always the same thing as helping someone. And something happens at the end of the book that clearly shows him the difference and neatly and easily transitions him. He realizes in the course of the end of the book that he had always actually wanted to help people instead of merely feeding their needs. He realizes that he had always wanted to do that. That's what made him do it to live his life the way he'd been living it. I think it's a rather nice transition. I was happy the way it came out, but no one's going to read it. And I now want that to change. I, uh, uh, Michael Lombardo, is there a twist at the end a la Jerry Seinfeld's move he loaned to George and Buddy? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Although I had to describe quite a bit of stuff like that in the every other scene in, in Gilroy Red Boy. Uh, Matt Sheridan, Friday nights with beer and pizza. Well, that sounds nice. Not beer and pizza, but wine and calzones. But no one, you're not here. None of you are here. Uh, oh, Jack O'Hara, let's see here. What are you going to write about? Well, that's another one of my questions. If I'm writing for an audience, the audience would be you. So do I follow a dream and just hope? Or do I do something a little more along the lines of maybe instead of going the Amazon, the Kindle Direct Publishing or whatever, maybe I, I go the route of uh, what Alex Sarando did for my uh, book manuscript, The Books of Power, a kind of a crowdfunder, sort of like something. I don't know how it would work. I would want to pick the brains of a lot of people here. Something where we agree on a project and I agree to write that project in installments and we raise money so that that wouldn't be the marketplace. And that would be a little bit of a, of a step down in my mind because it would be people who are already sort of committed to backing a project like that. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm still, uh, I, I'm still figuring it out or trying to figure it out. I need lots of input and I don't have it. Uh, uh, let's see here. Jasper Antonelli, you already have a captive audience for your books. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, and Paris, I think you should definitely write something for publishing. I'll certainly buy it. But would you? What if, what if it was about, you know, the venereal diseases of the Hasburg Empire? <laughs> you wouldn't buy that. Uh, uh, I wish I could give you self-publishing advice, but I only know the world of web serials, not Amazon publishing. I don't know at all. I uh, Maybe some sort of pay-as-you-go crowdfunding or GoFundMe or something like that to avoid Amazon, but then it wouldn't be on Amazon. Then people wouldn't be able to just find it the way Amazon Unlimited serves up new discoveries to me at a regular basis. Um, well, Reed, Steve, we have not seen Deb in a while. When will she be on next? I have no idea. I have no idea. I keep trying, but I can't make her be on, on the Steve. She's up in Maine. Uh, Jenny Park says, sorry, I'm late. Inexcusable. The Spaminator is here with an evil laugh. <laughs> uh, Skolder says, no wine nor calzones this Friday. I'm cutting, dude. Time to get shredded, bro. <laughs> uh, uh, Jack O'Hara says, have you always been exclusively a wine drinker? Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, Matt Sheridan is responding to Skolder. Spaminator says, you need to do a writing workshop video series. What is good writing? How to do it? Basic nuts and bolts from the perspective of a professional book review. Well, that would be great for BookTube. Or author to, sure, and that's that's not a bad idea at all. But I'm thinking about writing as well. I have a bug. I have a feeling about writing that I haven't felt in forever, and it is definitely geared to performance, to money, to an audience, to what happens next, as opposed to the community, the largely unfelt community of of Nanorima. It was easier to feel the community when I could go to a live sit-in, but after COVID, I'd, I'd be more leery about doing that. And I didn't, I wouldn't go to them now anyway with a little dog at home who can't go with me. Uh, let's see here. Leo Percara, hello, Steve. Do you think a good writer can be made out of a bad or adolescent taste? Like someone liking Bukowski too much and thinking he's the greatest thing ever and authors alike. Yes. Yeah. And it's the same way you would do, you would, the way that you could make, uh, the way that you could change that for the better 
is the same way you would do it with writing, the same way we do it with reading. I learned this the hard way. The, the wrong way to do it with reading is to sneer and say, well, aside from the sneering that I do on this channel, but the, the, the wrong way with reading is to say, no, you're reading the wrong people. Here are the right people. Uh, that's, that's wrong on a number of different levels. There's not anybody. A saint would still dig in their heels on something like that. Instead, the right way is to find out what the young man, of course, this is going to be a young man between the ages of 18 and 25, find out what they like and give them recommendations that step them up the ladder away from the stuff they like while still giving them the kinds of things they like until eventually you've got them reading stuff that will make them embarrassed to go back to Bukowski except for old time's sake. That can be done. I've done that myself. <laughs> uh, uh, Dylan M., we may not be a captive audience in the way you've described the Green Brothers be before, but I doubt I'm alone in feeling as if you've built up enough literary credit where I'd be happy to read your fiction. Uh, well, you know what they say, those who can do and those who can't get a freelance gig at the New York Times. Uh, but nevertheless, I've written a huge amount of fiction. I, it's I'm not, I don't consider, uh, most people say that a critic is a stillborn writer. They're a writer who can't hack it. That may be true, but most writers can't hack it. <laughs> so I, I, I've written a lot of fiction. I think I, I think I could I could write something that would be readable. I just don't know how to do it. I my uh, the friend that I was talking to about it kept using the term passive income uh, in addition to side hustle. Uh, uh, Flora should be reading. Hi Steve. I hope you end up publishing your Troy novel too because you made it sound amazing. Well, if I go this route, what would stop me from publishing Troy War? I'm just putting, you know, a $4 price tag on it. What would stop me from doing that? If, I mean, people do this all the time. I know that for a firsthand fact. I read their crappy manuscripts. So I know they do it for, all the time. Commissioning a cover, you know, hiring an editor to proofread the thing. I, and then there you go. I, there are services out there. I know this is possible. And then it wouldn't be just that, oh, well, I wrote I wrote this interesting sex novel for Camp NaNoWriMo. I'll tell you all about it, but it's nowhere where you could read it. I, uh, uh, Jasper Antonelli, if you self-publish, commission a good designer. So many self-published books are unreadable for most people on aesthetic grounds. I agree. I agree. But then again, is so is that what we're talking about here? When we talk about the kinds of things that I'm bringing up, are we talking about a stake? Are we talking about money, an outlay of money? I have to believe that our common aesthetics are not so radically different that a lot of the stuff I get every day, the self-published stuff I see every day, they look like something the dog vomited up. I have to believe that the, the author of that book also knows that it looks like something the dog vomited up and simply can't afford more. So is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about a stake of money? Is that what I should be thinking about first? That I'm going to have to lay out money before I make any back? Seems probably likely. I don't know, though. I don't know. There are plenty of, of webinars and YouTube videos of people saying you don't have to lay out any money to publish something and start making passive income on Amazon. See, that's why I wish I could have a bunch of you over here for Wine and Calzones. Frida would scream at you for a while and then ignore you, and then we could talk about this until one in the morning when we're singing sea shanties. <laughs> uh, Michael Lombardo, do you look at the Amazon top list to see what genres are selling? I always think of Jack Nicholson's character in As Good As It Gets, the cranky guy who writes romance novels. No, that that's the one thing I wouldn't do. I have plenty of ideas. There are plenty of things I want to write. I'm sure that if I gave, if we were to do some sort of uh, GoFundMe thing, some sort of crowdfunding thing, I am I am certain that if it, if we did something like that and my job was to give you a menu of possibilities and you can pick the one you want me to write for subscription or money or whatever and I would do that I feel certain that I could come up with a menu of things that a lot of you would would be interested in seeing but the menu would come from inside me it wouldn't come from looking at what's popular I that kind of thing I know plenty of people who write that way and I don't want to be one of them uh uh, let's see here. Oh, Jerome, wait, where, where do we go? Jerome Jacobson. I know it may be too controversial, but I love your commentaries on the Bible. The 20 or so videos you've made on the subject tickle my brain. I'd like a 300 page Steve commentary. That could certainly be one of the menu of possibilities where I, I do a book of exegesis of the entire Bible, book by book. Uh, well, read. what if you wrote a book, but release it as an email newsletter, one chapter at a time every month? 
Well, okay, yes, I could. There's a way that I could structure that so that money, I hate to say this because it's so unlike me, but it's what I've been thinking about when it comes to writing. Money is an issue here. Money is an active part of this. Something about my work, my fiction, being good enough for people to pay for. Something about Gilroy Rentboy, uh, the experience of Camp NaNoWriMo has been just changing my thoughts on the matter. And that's been one active element. Now, I know that people do subscription newsletters. I, I know that that happens. I might be the only person in the world who doesn't do one yet. Uh, but and, and I could do that. But a subscription newsletter model like that would mean that I wouldn't be in the marketplace. No one who didn't know about it would ever know about it, in other words. No, I wouldn't be a thing like the... Like that that bar when you go to to Amazon, you've got that that constantly changing bar based on your viewing or reading or buying history. Here are some things you might like. I look at that bar all the time. I find stuff from there all the time that I end up finding interesting in one way or another, or occasionally good. And there wouldn't be any element of that. It would be a closed loop. And I I don't know. I don't know if that's what I want. Uh, Matt Sheridan says, publish it, Steve, but I don't know what it you're referring to. Michael Lombardo, there seem to be a lot of young adult themed books of DC characters, maybe something to explore. There's a very short list of people who get tapped for that work, and I'm not on that list, and I will never be on that list. <laughs> Take my word for it. I will never be on that list. That list comes from Blue Checkmark Twitter. And I, I not only am I not ever going to be on that list, but I now have about 5,000 videos of me condemning that kind of worldview and that kind of politicking. So it won't be me. <laughs> no, no, getting a deal like that, writing a Star Trek novel or a DC Comics novel, that would be wonderful. But there's a, there's a fairly small list of people who get that kind of work. Uh, Jasper says, uh, you probably need somebody experienced in book formatting, paper quality, a uh, book which costs money. You already have the platform, which is the hardest part, I think. Yes, well, maybe maybe that's the right way to look at it, the optimistic way to look at it, but then where would I go for that? I know there are all sorts of layers. There are people, uh, there are people on YouTube who do webinars where they say, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm going to do everything myself. I'm going to learn it all myself. Gutters and margins and page numbers and when and where and how you pay for an ISBN and all that sort of thing. And then a, a step aside from them, there are companies that will do that. Here is, here's our brochure. We will make your book. We will make it look good. We will make it look to your specifications. We will put it on Ingram and BookSpark and Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and Kobo. And you just, we'll do all of that so that you don't have to and we'll charge you for it. Uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, there's, a pro excuse me, there's a profusion of those kinds of services out there. Just a profusion of them. I need to do a lot of research, but I don't want I don't want to be bogged down with a lot of research. I want to get this done. I want to start this. The comments between the reaction that I had to Camp NaNoWriMo and the comments of a writer friend of mine, I'm now thinking that this is something that I've waited on way too long. The, the, the thrill of getting work out there that people can pay for and have and read under my own name, I have <laughs> I have a rather long history of that, but not under my own name. So that so that it almost never happens. I think probably two times in my life it's happened where someone totally unsuspecting has picked up a book or uh, a short story, read it, and then snapped their eyes to me and said, "Oh my God, you wrote this." <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, to a flurry of, de, of denials from me. That, that's why I was so alarmed when, in a, in a, a Steve Stream months ago, uh, somebody started naming a couple of my authors. Not the authors that I always say I love, but the authors I rather conspicuously almost never mention. Um, that's a little weird. Uh, but that almost never happens. And usually it's a flurry of denials because there are a whole bunch of NDAs and whatnot involved. But to do it under my own name, that to to pay under to to sell work under my own name that suddenly has an appeal to me that it never has that i don't know why if it, i don't know why if maybe that's connected with the fact that even though camp nanorimo is over i'm still writing every day 
I'm still writing fiction every day. I, I wrote three chapters of a novel that's now going to have to be junked because it's been squashed like a bug. But plenty of other ideas are coming to mind. Plenty of them. I won't, I won't let tonight go by without writing something, even if it's just to continue the cop novel that I don't think has a future. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Anthony Rugier says, uh, you might have answered this, but are we getting that compiled reviews ebook? I would like to. Yeah, it's a completely different story. That is a manuscript that already exists. It's already vetted. It's already formatted. It already exists. It's already made. Some of you have it. If that was a, a GoFundMe, the only step left for that would be to brush it up completely, give it a once over, put a price tag on it, and put it on Amazon. Uh, the Spaminator, look, if people will pay for Twilight fan fiction, you have nothing to worry about. Yeah, right. Authors say that all the time. Uh, but I'm not taking anything for granted. And I'm not expecting that I won't have to work. Uh, Matt Sheridan, I'm thinking about publishing my short story on John Wilkes Booth, but I'm constantly rewriting it. I might also send it to a literary magazine. It shouldn't be a short story. It's a whole novel. It's a whole novel. Just say it. <laughs> it's a short story. Sure, you can you can round it off to a short story to start with. Plenty of novels started that way, but it should be a novel. Uh, RTL LTR, sorry if off topic, but could you recommend a one volume history of the Vietnam War? I think about the Stanley Carnell book, but is there a better option? Max Hastings wrote a really good one as well. Uh, the Carnell book is still really good. Max Hastings is also really good, uh, although that is off topic. But then again, I probably exhausted the topic. Uh, Jared Henderson is here. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, I would certainly spend some money on your work. If you decided to get rid of all your commas, all <laughs> All the lit lovers on YouTube would call you the next Cormac. Well, perhaps I'd write a work of philosophy. Hmm. <laughs> Believe me, I've been really tempted to write a book, just 125, 135 pages, called The Bro to The Bro Guide to Life, that lures people in with the mocking title, but really is an improved version of uh, thoughts about how a young man should live in the world. <laughs> That is very, very tempting. Not only because I would finally have something to just point to. When people say, all right, well, you you mock Jordan Peterson, you mock, you know, all of these uh, these self-help gurus. What do you suggest instead? I'd be able to say this. <laughs> this is what I suggest instead. Here is advice that isn't dumb, that doesn't talk down to you, that isn't based on rampant misogyny. Here is advice that will, you can actually read think about then take and use <laughs> to be a better person i often think about that <laughs> that would be one of if i did a drop down menu of possible things that people can finance that would the bro guide to life would definitely be one of them uh uh let's see here anthony ruger says write a short story about john wilkes not booth <laughs> no the john wilkes booth story is great it is great and it should be a novel that takes place in the saloon but that also that weaves its way in and out of his mind as he gets drunker and drunker and drunker through the whole of his life the whole of his brother's lives the whole of the pre-war south the whole of pre-war america this grand gigantic pinchonian narrative streaming through the brain of a slightly addled really sharp john was, was really smart he was also really attractive just as it with with your writing would be pushed because you would have to simulate the gradual expansion and loss of control that someone has when they're drinking all night. And your reader would know the whole time what ends that night. The, your reader would know the whole time how the story ends. Oh, <laughs> that, you could do a short story if you want, but that should be a novel. That is a terrific novel. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Art, uh, oops, wait. I'm losing things here. Leo Picard, RTL is responding to RTL LTR. Our Vietnam by Languth is pretty good, I think it is. Uh, Matt Sheridan, yes, published the antidote to Jordan Peterson's rubbish. <laughs> That's exactly what it would be. God Almighty, wouldn't it be the crowning irony if I if I wrote something like that and it it, it took off? That would be the crowning irony. Oh my God. Uh, Michael Lombardo, what? Yeah, but I don't know what that means. You're importing habits from Twitter. People do that all the time on Twitter. What? No punctuation, no reference, no, no, no. I have no idea what that's about. Uh, the Spaminator, working on a collection of short stories now. I'd like to publish it, but I'm not going to worry about it until I have 10 public-worthy stories. 
Uh, Dylan M., speaking of your reviews and the Green Brothers, I recently read your review, perhaps rant, of Margaret Talbot's New Yorker profile of John Green. Whilst I disagreed with you, it was a pretty, it was a joy to read. <laughs> yeah, it got me going. Uh, is Shannon Sales, have you thought of writing a four piece investigative report on the Vanderpump Rules scandal. It seems to be the it story now. No, I confess I have not thought of that. <laughs> Matt Sheridan, my only problem with YM story is that Booth seems much more interesting than my main character. My story. Matt Sheridan, my only problem with my story is that Booth seems much more interesting than my main character. Well, that's your story talking to you. Uh, I wish I could snap my fingers and have you over here. Oh, my God. You need a good Steve talking to is what you need. That's your story talking to. That's your story telling you that John Wilkes Booth should be your main character. And he absolutely should be. Get your other character out of there. <laughs> absolutely out of there. You can have someone at the table or a couple of people at the table. You can have the bartender. You can have ladies coming and going, maybe dancing, depending on where you want to have Booth that evening. I think we know where he was that evening. No, he was drinking in his room, wasn't he? But that doesn't matter. He could easily have had company. He's your main character. It's it's his story. Oh my God, what an epic novel it would be. I remember, I thought about it, though. that was months and months ago that you proposed that on a Steve stream, I think. And I thought about it the whole night, wishing that that idea had come to me. What an idea that would be. To, as that he, he starts off angry, sober, unfocused, unsure, he said, you got this demon idea in the back of his head, but he's not sure he'll do it. And then it grows as the alcohol flows and the all everything comes in. Childhood, brothers, uh, romances, politics. Oh god. Uh it would be it would be incredible. Just incredible. Uh I would call it Booth, except there was a historical novel about John Wilkes Booth that was called Booth. But Booth would work as a, as a working title. A work like this. You'd want to shoot for 300,000 words, and that would need a working title. You need a working title with that, or you would just, it would bury you alive. Uh, uh, yes, the Spaminator says Booth is your main character. He's absolutely right. Yeah, even from even from a distance and even in his state. <laughs> he's, he's absolutely right. The, Bo the reason Booth seems more interesting than your main character is because Booth is your main character. Your novel should be constantly getting sucked into the maelstrom of his growing psychosis, his alcohol-fueled psychosis, and trying to pull itself back out and then getting sucked back in and then trying to pull itself back out. It would be tough to write. But in this case, you want the narrative to reflect what's happening in the story. I don't always advise that. That isn't always what something writers need to do. But in this case, oh, yes. Oh, yes. You want the narrative itself to reflect what's happening you want the reader to feel by the penultimate chapter that anything could happen because anything is going to happen right after the novel ends <laughs> anyway uh carolyn nixon do you have a suggested biography of heinrich ibsen yeah what was the one what was the i feel like a streamer chat hey chat <laughs> thanks for the super chat oh <laughs> uh, what was the what was it meyer it was a big, fat Ibsen biography from, what, 50 years ago, 40 years ago? It was trem tremendously good. Really, really readable. Was it Meyer? I don't I don't want to leave the chat to look it up, or I will lose the chat. But I, I strongly recommend that. I just don't remember. Oh, my. I, I seem to remember, maybe this is just the Marvel Comics fan in me, but I seem to remember that the author's first and last name both started with M. Oh, <laughs> that's not helping you at all. I'll find out. I'll figure it out. Uh, Michael Lombardo, great that you're talking about The Leap as a published fiction author, but I'll address the elephant in the room. How will it affect your YouTube output? I don't think it will. Why would it? Uh, I don't think it will. But then again, my YouTube output is another topic for Steve's dream discussion, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, I have been getting a couple of emails. One of them was very, very touching, but a couple of them have been a little bit less touching. Uh, about people expecting five videos a day. <laughs> so I'm, if that is my YouTube output, then it would decrease, but it has to decrease anyway. There's no other channel on YouTube, anywhere on the platform, that gives you thoughtful, engaged, detailed content.
five times every day. Uh, that can't be, if that's our definition of what my YouTube output is, then it's going to have to take a hit anyway. But, but well, that's a whole other subject. Uh, Matt Sheridan, it's funny that you brought up the pinch nest aspect of my story because I was thinking about Mason and Dixon while writing it. Yeah, but it's not a story. It's a novel. You can write it as a story to submit it the way so many writers have done, but you will be, oh my God, <laughs> you will be badly misserving posterity if it isn't a novel. It is a 350,000 word novel, at least. It's the epic that John Wilkes Booth never had and in a way deserves. Now, if, if Norman Mailer can do that for Lee Harvey Oswald, then you can do that for John Wilkes Booth. It would require a huge amount of research on your part, but I'd be happy to help you with that. Oh my God, I'd be happy to help you with this book six ways from Sunday. But it is a book. It is not just a short story. Uh, and Mason and Dixon, I mean, your own voice will come through. Your own approach to it will come through. But Mason and Dixon is a perfect template to start with. Absolutely. Ex except that Mason and Dixon is a little bit crazy right from the start. And I, your booth would not be. It would start off sober in every sense of the word. And it would get more and more Pinchon-esque as it went along. Uh, uh, Shannon Sales, is there actual money in magazine writing, reviews, short stories, etc., or has time passed? No, there's money in, in reviews. I don't know about short stories. There's money in writing reviews. You can so you can do it for a living if you have enough venues or if you have a venue where you're in really tight. If you're in really tight with, uh, you know, the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or the Christian Science Monitor here in Boston, then that will work as a backstop. Uh, it helps if you have you know, lots of gigs, bringing in lots of uh, money coming from a few different places. Uh, but fiction? Uh, Anthony Ruger, is Kaplan's bio of Gore Vidal any good? Yes, it is. Yeah. it's It's got uh, problems, and you'll see them right away, especially if you've read Jay Perini's biography. You'll see the problems right away. But, uh, oh, I read Jay Perini's, and it was okay. It was very pedestrian and fluffy. Yes. Well, you're going to read, when you read Kaplan and when you read Perini, you're going to come out with the same response in both cases, uh, which is Gore Vidal still needs a great biography. He doesn't have one, and he still needs one. He wrote Palimpsest himself, and you know that was as much a claim on his part to a great biography of himself as anybody's ever done. But in, in Kaplan's case and in Perini's case especially, there is an Oedipal element that absolutely has to be gone. If you're going to do a Gore Vidal, I know a, a one person out there in the world who could write a great, a genuinely great Gore Vidal biography, but we'll see the second comic first. So, but he hasn't had one yet, is what I'm saying. They're both good, but you're going to see, especially if, you, if you've read the one, if you've read Perini, you're going to see what Kaplan's doing wrong. They don't do the same things wrong, but they both do things wrong. <laughs> uh, Aaron says, good evening, Steve. Good evening. Uh, Michael Lombardo says, Oscar Meyer. Uh, the hot dogs, or, or is is Oscar Mayer the uh, the the author of the Ibsen biography? I, Meyer sounds right. Uh, it had a white cover with a sketch of Ibsen on it. I, I'm not. I can't check, or I'll kick myself out of my own stream. But I I know that it's out there, and it was really good. Uh, Dylan M, you must remember Michael. Steve does not need sleep like us mortals. He'll sleep. Uh, he'll simply write whilst filming. Well, I won't write while I'm filming, but I do have more hours in my day than you do. I'm not crowing about that. I know that a lot of you uh, work really hard or uh, or wish that that could be true, but it, it's simply true for me, and that is where I would get a lot of this done. I know that that would not be a problem. That's not an element, in, an elephant in the room. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, I think Dr. Mudd should be in, should be the main character. Matt Sheridan, Dr. Mudd would be an interesting character if I wrote him I would dismantle any notion that he was innocent. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The, your novel ends before Dr. Mudd enters the story. And Dr. Mudd, I should say, is not interesting. <laughs> He's not interesting in any way. Your novel ends long before Booth meets him. I, the, 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 one of the, the lightning bolt tensions that would be animating your whole narrative is the reader knows what happens after the last page they know the next thing that happens and they know that from the beginning oh, oh. uh dylan m whilst we're discussing historical fiction why is it that leon Uris has been forgotten trinity and exodus both seem like they should have cemented him as one of the great 
American novelists. Yeah, but do they? I mean, think about them. I enjoyed them too, but think about them. They're a little bit leaden, don't you think? They're a little bit leaden, and they're the best of what he did. I, it doesn't surprise me. I, I'm kind of surprised about Exodus, but even so, it doesn't surprise me. I, you take figures like, uh, well, when you're talking about Leon Uris, the natural example would be Herman Wouk, but also uh, Thomas Flanagan. You, you look at these big historical author writers like that, even if you want to go into the gothic thriller realm, Thomas Tryon, you might have enjoyed reading them when you were reading them. You might have enjoyed a reread, but if you take a step back, you'll see this is leaden. And it's not necessarily dated, but if it's leaden, it's not going to, to live from one generation to the next. If it's leaden, then the next generation, when the grandfather recommends it, the, the grandson is going to view it as a chore. And that, that will, that, that's its death right there. I agree that they are very substantial, but uh, now it doesn't surprise me that he's largely forgotten. Uh, Constantino 666, hi Steve, only just arrived. Well, we're stopping at 10 past the hour. Uh, Aaron, I've tried writing and submitting short stories in sci-fi and fantasy. As far as I know, there aren't as many literary markets that don't demand submission fees. Seems like making money from shorts is a thing of the past. Never pay a submission fee for anything, ever. Take it right out of your mind. They are all scams. Never pay an admission fee for anything. So just remove that. And I think you're right. Once we remove that element, I think you're right. It's not a thing of the past, but it's incredibly endangered. Whereas 70 years ago, it was everywhere. You could easily make pocket money, at least. Uh, if you were industrious, you could easily do that. 70 years ago, this whole topic of mine, of me writing neat stuff that hooks an audience for money... 70 years ago, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have hesitated at all. I would have been making a very comfortable living. Uh, Skolder says, the novel has to end before what you know will happen next. The Prague Cemetery, for example, you know the Holocaust is coming, but the novel ends 50 years before it. Are you telling me that you are a fan of the Prague Cemetery? That would be wonderful. I've almost never met one. None of the critics that, that I knew, I knew all the critics who were reading about, reading, writing about that thing when it came out, None of them seemed to me to get it. They, they got something, but they, they didn't get, I think, what, what Echo was doing. I, that would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, there we go. Michael Lombardo. So I was right. It is to the, the first and last name with the same initials. It's Michael Meyer, 1971. Okay, so I forget who asked the original question a million years ago, and I can't check or I'll boot myself off my own live stream. But Michael Meyer's 1971 biography of Ibsen is terrific. So if you're looking for a big biography of Ibsen, that's the one that I would recommend. It's the only one I've ever read. Uh, Jared Henderson is back. Only thing I struggle with as a writer slash YouTuber is accountability on my writing. With YouTube, people notice if I don't post a video. With my writing, nobody else can keep me accountable. Perhaps you need a writing partner. <laughs> Perhaps you need someone to browbeat you on Voxer and on a regular basis. Perhaps you need to come to Hyde Cottage. <laughs> my little daffodil <laughs> I volunteer my services uh, Behorn says off topic from writing but is reading the warden a requisite before reading Barchester Towers no no. Uh -uh. especially as we learned today when I gave a deathless reading of chapter 2 where Anthony Trollope goes on at unnecessary length about the, the gist of what happened in the warden uh, no it isn't at all. Maybe that isn't true for some of the other Barchester novels. Like, for instance, if you haven't if you haven't read any other Barchester novels, then the Last Chronicle of Barset, the big book that ends the series, I don't think would would pay off for you. I don't think I don't think you would enjoy it as much if you if you're reading the Barchester novels, the Barchester novels, uh, for for five of the six books, you are waiting for someone to tell off one particular character. And it actually happens in the last book. But you have to wait that long for it. You don't get it otherwise. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. I don't want to lose the chat here. Uh, but I don't want to miss anybody either. I can feel that I'm reeling Jared Henderson. Is. I can feel that I'm re you need a writing partner. That's the accountability. And maybe I do too. Especially if I'm going to start writing for money. Uh, the Spaminator's back. Steve, in an earlier Steve stream, you, how would you even remember? It's been so long since we did a Steve stream. 
Uh, you ordered me to read The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 2023. I moved it to the top of the pile and finished it last week. Now I'm obsessed with the book. Yes. The, the Hunchback of Notre Dame is the exact opposite of Les Miserables. <laughs> it's a, the exact opposite. One is the original formless, shapeless, endless, baggy monster. And the other, Notre Dame de Paris, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, is a chiseled, perfect plot. Nothing, not one single piece moves in it that isn't perfectly orchestrated for all the other pieces, and everything works in one clock like unison. It always reminds me of, uh, 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 I won't say whether or not he was once upon a time a Steve author or a guest for Wine and Kelsons at Hyde Cottage, but John Barth, the American writer John Barth, who saw around him. A, you know, 50 years ago in the American writing scene, all these people uh, uh, experimenting with stream of consciousness and formlessness and whatnot, he decided to write a novel that was the apotheosis of plot, the sotweed factor. And I always think about uh, about that comparison the same way. That You've got The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables, and they don't seem like they're written by the same author at all. They're completely different views of fiction. Uh, Anyway, Gandhi Angle says, just jumping in here, recently finished Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane. Enjoyed it with one caveat. Mary Pat is driving a noisy car, and it's followed by Marty, not very inconspicuous. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Where did she go? Uh, where did... Mary Pat is driving a noisy car on its last legs while following Marty, not very inconspicuous. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure what the caveat is there. I don't want to spoil the book or, or really talk about a book no one else in the chat has read, but I'm thinking about, I think I'm picturing what you're talking about, and I'm not seeing the caveat. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, what is your take on the use of the term sci-fi versus science fiction fantasy SFF is a proper term to use? Yes, well... <laughs> I don't want to call down fire and brimstone from the Wales border, now do I? <laughs> since since uh, the outlaw bookseller went on, uh, made a video that is now infamous on BookTube, saying that you know that calling it sci-fi is completely forbidden. It's completely wrong to do, and here are the 50 reasons why you must call it SFF. <laughs> I didn't... Uh, <laughs> if it bothers Stephen so much, then call it SFF. What what skin off my nose is it? I admit, my first and second viewing of that video bugged me I, more than a little. I, I thought about it more than than he probably intended me to. I I, I real there were a lot of people that, that have responded to that video by saying that it was gatekeeping. I don't think I don't think that's accurate. His love of the genre is so glowing. I have a hard time reconciling that level of love and geekish enthusiasm with gatekeeping of any kind. It was prescriptive, of course, and I, maybe there's a part of me that doesn't like that, but I admit, the, the, the way that it rubbed me the wrong way, that video about the correct terminology for science fiction, uh, the way that it rubbed me the wrong way initially was purely personal. Uh, no offense to the outlaw bookseller here at all. None intended whatsoever. You should all subscribe to his channel. It's a fantastic channel. He is a perfect example of the kind of booktube channel that deserves 10 times as many subscribers as I have. Uh, no offense to him whatsoever, but I've read more of this genre than he has. I've written more about it than he has, even though he's written a book on it. And I've met and known and talked to, I've known and liked, been friends with more of its authors than he has. I never thought twice about calling it sci-fi. So naturally, when I watched a video saying that if you call it sci-fi, just that use of the term, you're an outsider to the genre. Well, <laughs> that, of course, bothered me when I was watching that video. Because if I'm an outsider, he bloody well is. <laughs> but, uh, but then I thought, you know, no, this is all done out of precision, out of, he's, he's doggedly defensive or protective about the genre. He believes in it. He believes how important it is. That's where that video comes from. A protective kind of love. And it's it's hard to dislike that. The minute I when I watched it the third time, I got that and sort of 
you know, got over myself and dropped my ankles. But as far as I'm concerned, you can call it anything you want. <laughs> so he definitely has a preference. Now we all know. That. I think I don't think there's anybody on BookTube now who who doesn't start to say sci-fi now and think about that video and seize up. <laughs> Uh, Skolger says, I love the Prague Cemetery. I think it is one of the greatest achievements in historical fiction. Well, slow down there, Seymour. <laughs> it's it's really good, but maybe I need to look at it again. Maybe I do. There was a hardcover copy at the Brattle just the other day, and I didn't get it uh, because I was sure that I had one. And I got back here, and it was nowhere to be found. <laughs> nowhere to be found. Uh, let's see here. Aaron says, yes, submission fees are garbage. My point was that there are more professional genre magazines than literary well you can keep submitting i mean the, the editor who's in, whoever's in charge of magazine of fantasy and science fiction or analog or asimov's they might not take your story but they're going to notice if you keep submitting stuff especially if it keeps getting better uh, there's a lot to be said for persistence in other words i think we've covered that haven't we uh carolyn nixon i've got it author of heinrich ibsen oh it was you carolyn nixon okay yes michael meyer 1971. <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever see you again. Uh, Aaron says, it's Steve, it's Steve offering a writing retreat at Hyde Cottage. Well, if I could snap my fingers and have the... I used to have editors and writers over here every Friday night. And I, I confess, I would look forward to it. By Wednesday night, I was looking forward to it. I, there were, I mean, for a couple of years, it, it was a kind of a, a mixed anticipation because my girls were really old and it, they would get really excited and that would often cause them to lose control of their bowels or uh, it, it got a little complicated and then COVID ended it completely but I miss it I really do if I if I thought that there were six or seven people who could come over here every Friday night the invitation would be wide open writing retreat book talk reflecting on the weekend book tube <laughs> oh, that would be so much fun. Uh, Gandhi Angles need to add she had a bag of money from Marty and could have purchased another car. <laughs> You're still on about, about the Dennis Lane. Uh, oh God, I'm losing track of the. Uh, I'm losing track of the chat here. Dylan M. Did they not understand what he was doing, or did they want not want to understand it? It always struck me that. Eco's reputation in the English speaking world, oh, Eco's reputation has been pigeonholed and he's a lot, a lot out of it. I would agree with that point. Makes me wish that Jason Harrigan hadn't left the ranks of BookTube, Eco's foremost fan and uh, a perfect candidate to that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, I know it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but I would say that all of that pigeonholing came from this, the gigantic success of The Name of the Rose. A perfect example of how a book can hurt an author's career even while it's making them independently wealthy. Perfect example of that. I could be wrong about that. There are, there are people who know his work a lot better than I do. But yeah, not a lot of his novels, not, not many of his novels read anything like any of his other novels. And I, I think The Name of the Rose produced a, an environment where people were saying, I want another Name of the Rose. Thanks very much. I want you to write the Name of the Rose for the rest of your life. There are plenty of authors who would get $1.4 million in American money and think, okay, <laughs> I'll gladly do that. <laughs> I am one of those people. I don't have any talent. Not like he does. I would certainly have said yes to that, but he, no. <laughs> uh, Jared Henderson is back. My people will contact your people, Steve. Well, you're the big shot on BookTube. You probably do have people flunkies left and right <laughs> i just have a sleeping little miniature schnauzer <laughs> but i would be happy to be a writing partner if you need accountability i am very very good at that very good at it if you were to spend the whole of an afternoon checking the acknowledgement section of certain books you would find i would be willing to bet that in your own collection you have an acknowledgement section that says something like uh you know and also two S for a little, uh, to, you know for for all the help or to uh, to dog boy for keeping me on the tight leash or something like that. My favorite one being eons ago. Oh my god, probably forty years ago, more than that. Uh, a friend again, a friend had a book contract and simply could not fulfill it. Simply could not do it. Almost none of it, and yet couldn't return the advance. And so I stepped in. We had we had some wonderful meetings. And I did a huge amount of work, huge amount, more than I usually do, a huge amount of work. 
And a year later, the, the book came out and in the acknowledgement section, a whole bunch of acknowledgements, a whole bunch of people, agents and publishers and whatnot. And down at the bottom in the fine print of the acknowledgement section, it was, uh, how did it read? Uh, something like for SD for minor clerical assistance. <laughs> that was my favorite one. Uh, but anyway, Jack O'Hara, you are very interested in architecture, Steve. Are you very interested? Does the subject have any great literary works? I am very interested in architecture. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I don't know about great literary works, but I, I think it's, I don't know of uh, any great novel along the lines of, for instance, Body and Soul by Frank Conroy for music that deals with architecture. Steering clear here of Ayn Rand, and I hope all of you are as well. I don't, I don't know of anything like that. I usually just read nonfiction on the subject, especially uh, McKim, Mead, and White, without whom Boston would be unthinkable. Uh, Aaron says, I'm lucky enough to be part of a small Discord writing group with several talented writers. Critiquing the work of talented people is inspiring. That's the oft-missed value of such groups. Oh, I think, I think you've mentioned that. I'm invited to that group, I think. I was invited to that group, but I don't. Discord unnerves me, and I don't know why. Probably I'm exaggerating that. Uh, I, but I don't, I don't want it to be in person. I want you all to come over here. <laughs> I just feel like stamping my foot. Uh, Aaron is returning, saying sci-fi is wrong because the ghost of Harlan Ellison will scream at you if you do. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> uh, you're, I'm possibly the only person on this Steve stream who has been screamed at in person by Harlan Ellison. I wouldn't want to experience it again, but, <laughs> and I also don't want to say what's in a name. You know, I, the Outlaw Bookseller made points in his video. I don't think they were valid. Uh, I, I don't I don't like the threat, the verdict. If you don't do what I say, then you're not a real fan of this genre. I didn't like that. That really rubbed me the wrong way. And I didn't like the, the forbidding prescriptiveness of it. That there's this there's this complicated hedge work of things that you have to do just right, like passwords. Otherwise this genre isn't for you. I want as many people to read Sci science fiction, SFF, as possible. That, that kind of hedge work, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Gandhi Angle says, it was not realistic that, that oh, God, you're not still talking about Dennis Iain book. You're the only, we're the only two people in this chat who have read the book. Obviously, with the, that is not going to go anywhere. Uh, I, uh, anyway, uh, Michael Lombardo, William Johnstone's Westerns, Tom Clancy's Espionage, Robert Parker's Mysteries, Steve, if a publisher approached you to ghostwrite a novel for an author's estate of your choice, who would you pick? <laughs> uh, it's not one of the ones that you're naming. And it's never going to happen for some weird reason. It seems like it's never going to happen. And I want to get my answer in before Michael K. Vaughn gets his answer in. It would, of course, be Edgar Rice Burroughs. It would be John Carter of Mars. Of course, it would be John Carter of Mars. Uh, I would want to do that in a heartbeat. I would drop everything to do that. In A Princess of Mars, the first John Carter of Mars novel, we go 95, 96% of the novel with the adventure that we're having. And then at the end, we're told that seven or eight years pass. <laughs> and then the narrative takes up again. There's a gigantic gap where you could fit in all the adventures in the world, provided John Carter doesn't meet in those years any of the things he meets for the first time in later books. It's easy to do. Or you could you could just follow from the gigantic cliffhanger at the end of uh, no, I would love that would be the first thing that I would do. It would be John Carter stories. Absolutely. Uh, uh, let's see here. Pan Panza de Sancho says, AI has been on my mind. Many kids at school write their essays with AI, and many readers I know have said they wouldn't mind reading AI writing. I just wonder how might writing and reading change? Yeah, we're gonna find out. And, and Godwin's Law, I think, proves that we're gonna find out really fast. We're going, or is it Godwin's Law I'm thinking of? Uh, I always forget. <laughs> I want the one that's not about Nazis. Uh, we're, I think we're going to find out really soon, faster than people think. Uh, because, like, for instance, what was just mentioned, William Johnson's Westons, Tom Clancy's Espionage, Robert Parker's Mysteries, a, a publisher would be crazy. To, I mean, those things don't have a high overhead. They don't pay well. They have a very niche, small, and a relatively unexpanding audience. A publisher would be crazy 
to have one of those products or a product like that and think and not think about AI. Let's get it, let's hire a proofreader off, you know, Fiverr or Yelp for $15 an hour, but we'll have AI generate the next adventure. And we'll just have the proofreader brush things up. We'll have the proofreader catch the obvious AI things. We'll feed the text of the last 30 William Johnstone novels into AI and have it come out with the next one. I, that would probably not work right now, but boy, oh boy, will it work in two years. And if you're a publisher, that's going to cost you $1,000 total. That's You'd be crazy not to think of that. And the question we have to ask as readers is, if that process works, yeah, I mean, I, the people who ghostwrite Clancy or Johnstone or Robert Parker or whatever would be the first one to tell you that there is a large amount of formulaicness in it. If that process works, and if work here is is characterized as what pleases the readers, then why wouldn't a publisher do that? There's no fraud involved there. We have to decide the level of importance there. We have to decide what we think about that. But publishers, I don't, I don't think they have anything to decide. <laughs> One thousand dollars for a finished book instead of ten thousand—that's not a decision at all. You would do that in a heartbeat. You're fiduciarily ob obligated to do that if you're a publicly traded company. I—I'll be interested to see how it works out. Uh, uh, oh God, I've lost the chat here. Let's let's find out what we're doing here. Uh, let's see where. Oh my God, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm missing here. Let's, James Amex. How does the de how does the Death in Venice film compare to the book? The book is much better. I don't usually say that, but it's true. Golam Uadib, um, the correct term is sci-fi. There, there's an entire TV channel dedicated to it. They have some of the best made-for-TV movies out there. And we're not allowed to use sci-fi anymore. Or the outlaw bookseller will, will be angry with all of us. Uh, Gandhi Angles, thoughts on the Covenant of Water. Yeah. yeah. I need to have thoughts on the Covenant of Water fairly soon. Uh, I don't have any formulated thoughts on the Covenant of Water. I need to. Uh, I'm kind of on the hook for a, a pretty thorough rundown. But uh, certainly, I can certainly say that my thoughts were not jumping out of my skin to recommend it to everyone who moves. You've seen me have that reaction to a few books in the last year or two years. You're not going to see that reaction to this one. Uh, the Spaminator, what's the one aspect of writing that you see writers miss the mark on the most? Oh, it depends on what kind of writing. It's, it's different for different kinds of writing. Scholarly nonfiction, history, history and biography, the, the, aspect, the, the, the aspect of writing that they miss out on is that they forget they have to be entertaining. They have to, they have to be thrilling to read. And that doesn't mean talking down to your reader. That doesn't mean breaking things up into two-sentence paragraphs or two-sentence chapters or whatnot. It means honing a prose style, which can take a lot of work. It has nothing to do with your university credentials. The contemporary fiction, it'd be a whole other thing. It'd be a whole other set of aspects. To, uh, there isn't just one. Uh, Aaron, what are your thoughts on revision? You hinted at strong opinions about the advice on the cooling off period. Yes. Yes. That... That's one of the main things. Of course, I can't give all my thoughts on revision in the one minute that we have left on the Steve stream. But uh, yeah, I think that there should be a, a pronounced cooling off effect. And that runs counter to the instincts of a lot of writers, especially young writers, where they either want to edit everything as they're writing it, which is deadly. That is, you absolutely should not do that. Or once they're finished with it, once they've written the end, they want to go right at it again. You shouldn't do that. Put it completely out of your mind for months at a time. I would say six months. And come back to it as if it were the work of someone else. You'll be amazed at how at how clean you see it. Uh, Michael Lombardo, I would have never known there was such a defensive feeling toward the term sci-fi. I was raised on local UHF television stations, Saturday night sci-fi movies. Yeah, you know, a lot of people were. A lot of people were. I don't agree with Stephen at all. I don't agree with, I should say, I love his video, but I don't agree with the outlaw bookseller that it is, you know, this horrible thing. Uh, this this sign that you're not serious that you're an outsider to the genre i don't agree with that at all and he in in his now infamous video he cites a few science fiction authors i could cite just as many who don't care one way or another who say that that kind of gatekeeping is bad for the genre or who use the term sci-fi <laughs> it's, it's i don't think it's as clean cut but uh nevertheless yeah a lot of people have a favorable association with that terminology and still read all the greats and love them, appreciate them for who they are. 
Uh, Matt Sheridan, is Jason ever coming back to BookTube? No idea. I would tend to doubt it. Like I mentioned, if you're actively booktubing and then you stop, that space fills in. It's amazing that it, it, it fills in. Suddenly, you find it hard to imagine that you ever did it. I would imagine that by now, that space for him has completely filled in. Uh, Richardson Reads is here. Oh, isn't that nice? Uh, Skolder says, still about Echo, I can't read Italian, but I can read three Romance languages, so by brute force, I could see that Echo's English translations were not very good, especially in simplifying his diction. Uh, well, you would be assaulting the holy name of William Weaver if you do, if you say that, but I have heard this from Italian readers. I've heard from Italian readers that this is, this is the bare bones here. This is, this is not, uh, this is, this is not the, the full sense around that you get in the original. And a lot of the times they have been reposted. By people saying, well, no translation is, but I don't know. The impression I get is that there's much missing, even given the usual gradation in translation. So you could be right. Uh, Jack O'Hara, why be so bothered over the naming of something? SFF or sci fi? Whatever happened to who the hell cares? Well, the outlaw bookseller is the authority on the subject here, and he knows it, and I don't dispute that at all. And in his video, he makes a case. He may convince you, <laughs> but certainly it bothers him. And, uh, you know, I, it may, it's no skin off my nose. So uh, let's see here. Darth Mosasaur. I think I know that name. Are you this the first time in the chat? Steve, this is Tim Skinner. Hello. Good Lord. Tim Skinner? No way. Cannot be. <laughs> so that would be wonderful. Uh, the Spaminator account. How would you even find this stream? How do you even know? No one, no one even knows that I do this it's from the real world. Uh, most of these people are imaginary, especially the Spaminator. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say. Accountability is overrated. I wouldn't have become the world's greatest semi supervillain if anyone had tried to keep me accountable. No, no, no. Well, you did it because you've got, oh, I don't know, a whole box of screws loose. <laughs> but, but what Jared Henderson was saying is right. Accountability means a lot in writing, especially if you are a feckless young man who has never even met on a subway self-control. <laughs> if you've never even met self-discipline, if you've never even heard the term, then accountability partners can help a lot. Uh, I, I shouldn't even be so blithe because plenty of authors that I've known from previous generations also needed accountability. And I'm very good at that. I'm very good at supplying it. So it's not overrated. Uh, Michael Lombardo, oh, I picked up a TPB of The Name of the Rose during the last book sale, just in case a read-along comes up. Well, I wouldn't have the uh, the cobbles to do a read-along, because I don't know for sure that Jason Harrigan isn't coming back to Booktube. He could, and he's the only person who should do such a thing. So I, I, I've read the book a few times, but I wouldn't. Uh, uh, Jack O'Hara, who the hell cares in a thick Boston accent? <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about Boston Exit, so I couldn't I couldn't oblige you. Although somewhere on my channel, someone one of you must know how to find it. I've done so many videos that I can't find them myself. But somewhere on my channel, in response to a whole bunch of highfalutin poetry readings, I read a poem in a Boston accent, in a South Boston accent. I forget which poem it was, but it was a hoot to do. I wish I could find that video. Uh, Gandhi Angles recently watched the documentary Turn Every Page, enjoyed watching Carol and Gottlieb working relationship. Well, that makes one of us. Uh, Book Songs and Other Magic is here. Totally agree about Outlaw Bookseller. I haven't bothered to comment on his video, as I've noticed that he can't discuss things objectively. I think for a brief period, he shut down the comments on that video. I think it surprised him that he touched a nerve. Why it would, if, it, if it did surprise him, I don't know why it would surprise him. I didn't leave a comment on it. But touch a nerve with me. Absolutely. The very first reaction that I have, I want to stress, this is not my reaction now. I love his channel. I absolutely love that video. I think I know where that video comes from. I think it comes from love and protectiveness. And who can fault that? For a genre that's meant a lot to him, meant more to him than anything. Uh, but nevertheless, my very first reaction was, well, you know, who are the, hell, who the hell are you to tell me that I'm an outsider to a genre? When I, I'm, If I'm an outsider, you're bloody well an outsider as well. I, I, I immediately went to my credentials, which is never a thing you should do in reading. Uh, but it's the kind of video that'll make you do that. I, uh, so I'm, I, 
I think it's fascinating. Now, I, I took me a couple of watches of it to cool off about it, but now I think it's fascinating. Uh, that reading guy, hey, you can't start Steve streams without me. <laughs> I'm afraid so. We're, we're, we're going to wrap this up at 10 past the hour. So. Uh, that reading guy, I never gave permission. Oh, really? Oh, oh I guess I, this isn't consensual then. Uh, oh, God, wait. Oh, no, you're gone. Where, uh, Golam Uadib is back. I don't trust AI. The Butlerian Jihad happened for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> we could be right on the edge of thou shalt not make a machine in the form of a human mind. Uh, the Spaminator, Steve, pick my next read. Le Mortator, Middle Arch, Ovid's Metamorphoses, Beloved by... Did we go through this list last time? And that was like nine years ago? You haven't read all of these since then? <laughs> I... It, how about Middlemarch? <laughs> Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, Tony Morrison doesn't measure up to the other authors on this possible list. Ovid's Metamorphoses will be all about translations, Le Marte Artur, and you'll be on and on and on about the awkwardness of the diction. Let's just pick Middlemarch, okay? <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Clark, a recommendation for a great fantasy novel that has been overlooked is Richard Adams' Maya and Shardik. No one ever mentions these. Well. <laughs> uh, can we bounce around a few possible reasons why no one mentions Maya by Richard Adams. Any possible reasons why it seems to be overlooked? <laughs> uh, let's just move on, shall we? Uh, Gaddy Angles, looking forward to the upcoming release of John and Egg's book, King a Life. Hope it is wonderful. What do you mean, hope it is wonderful? I've praised it three times on this channel and written a review of it for Big Canoe News in Northern Georgia. Are you telling me that you didn't know about any of that? That you haven't met, read my review? I'm hoping that my review will be on the paperback. <sighs> With Big Canoe News right there in big letters under my name. It is wor wonderful. It is worth it. Get on the waiting list at your library. It's fantastic. Uh, Matt Sheridan is responding to Gavin Daniels. Me too. I love I, other, what, uh, all None of you know that I've been praising this book on my channel. What am I talking to myself over here? Uh uh, Skolder says, should I learn Italian just to translate Echo the way I think uh, fit? I would not take to learn to learn. Well, you could come up with a, it'd be, that would be a fun way to learn the language. You'd certainly have, you'd have an endless array of exercises to do. Uh, uh, although, since I can't ever even finish my first novel, maybe I would never finish the translation. Nah, I don't think so. The novel comes first. Uh, oh, wait, I lost the chat here. Uh, uh, Colin, what's the better Antarctic story? Worst journey in the world or South? Uh, Cherry Gerard is the better book, but no reason you can't read them both, right? Uh, no, it's not a contest, but worst journey in the world is South is a little bit boring, amazingly, considering <laughs> what it's all about. But uh, worst journey in the world is one of the greatest travel writing, excuse me, one of the greatest travel books ever written. Uh, Michael Mullins. 10 past the hour, 8, 10 central. I just got, um, yeah, I don't, I think, oh, you're right. We missed 10 past the hour. But we nevertheless can't do this forever. <laughs> we can't do this forever. Uh, Aaron says, AI will be the best James Patterson ever. Well, <laughs> James Patterson is the kind of thing I'm talking about. He's written a vast amount. The more you put into an AI, the better the end result is. Patterson is very, very watchful of his career, so he wouldn't allow it to happen unless he did it himself intentionally just for the fun of it. But his type of author, if the, if a publisher can pay $150 for software and get a usable text at the end that they only have to have someone proofread, they would be crazy not to explore that, especially if the main thing serving the reader well, actually happens. If that actually happens, they'd be crazy not to explore that. Uh, Matt Sheridan, did you read Jeffrey Tubin's book on militias yet, Steve? <laughs> In this one instance, I will allow the have you read question because I still can't bring myself to do it. I can't bring myself to do it. I actually took the finished copy off the shelf last night. When I, you know, I, I, when it's time, when when the bean can't see straight anymore, and it's clearly time to take it to put her to bed, then I set up the evening's reading. I'm still going to do a bunch of writing. I'm not going to do it out here. I'm going to do it in the little book room, so the bean can sleep. Uh, 
but I'm I, I'm setting I'm picking and setting up the reading that I'm going to do when I shift over to reading. And I I was putting around and I picked up the hardcover and all I could think about was I got to take Jeffrey Tubin to the little book room. It didn't work. It just <laughs> I know that a part of that reaction is juvenile. Those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, Jeffrey Tubin had an incident during a group Zoom chat where he uh, he pulled out his legislative docket uh, and started working it over <laughs> in front of everyone and said what I consider to be an obvious lie, which is that he had no idea he was still on camera. I think that's an obvious lie. I think the reason that he did it was because he knew he was on camera. I think it was sexual harassment. Uh, and it, it caused him to be peremptorily dropped by a lot of places that were getting him on as a talking head. See, I'm saying it already, as a talking head uh, on legal matters. And then he started to show up on those places again, and every time he did, I just burst out laughing at the screen. And now he has a new book on an interesting subject, on American armed militia movements. I want to read it. I might even want to read him on it. He's a pretty, he's a pretty good, rigorous thinker. See, I can't help it. But how on earth, in a previous generation, in a previous century, if you if you did something like that and it became public knowledge, you would retire to an island in the English Channel and no one would ever hear from you again. Plain and simple. You would not be putting the burden on the public to overlook that. You would simply disappear. And we don't live in that age anymore, that that no one disappears for any reason now. But I can't. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, let's let's just move on here. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, that reading guy is responding to Matt Sheridan. Be careful when mentioning that name on the live stream. Tubin has become a verb and for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> uh, Gandhi Angle says, who do you have a bigger complaint with, Gottlieb or Caro? It would be Caro, but by a narrow margin. Uh, the Spaminator, I am stunned that you remembered me listing off those books in the last stream, you seen that old boot. <laughs> and I'll have you know there are two less books than this time. It, 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 uh, there might be two. It's not less. It's fewer. It, there might be two fewer books, but it'd still be nice if you could, you know, prize yourself off your own thumb and get to work on one of them. So maybe you have a different list next time. <sighs> Second-rate Lex Luthor. <laughs> uh, Matthew Just, have you watched some YouTubers that try a famous author's writing routine they seem very popular. Yes, they do seem really popular. And I love watching those videos. I watched one. There's a, a young writer. He's pretty much the only thing I've found from AuthorTube that I like so far. And now, of course, I'm going to blank on his name. One of you can find him, I'm sure. He's a young guy. He's very soft-spoken. Uh, doesn't appear to have a job. I think he lives maybe at home and just writes. And he just did a series of videos about writing for Camp NaNoWriMo. I think that's how my author tube search found him. But he also intersperses that with videos. And one of them was he did a video where he imitated Neil Gaiman's writing routine. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was really, really well done. He He's a very professional author tuber, very clean, well-filmed videos, but very personable. I, I'm blanking on his name, but he, he did a video like that. And I've seen other videos like that. And they work really well. I, I, they're very interesting. Uh, I was very interested. I think it was, the, the, you know, it was, it was the Neil Gaiman video that he did. Uh, one of Neil Gaiman's pieces of advice is always write your first draft in longhand. Always don't work on the computer for your first draft. Write longhand so that you have no distractions and so that you're paying attention to every word because your hand actually has to form it on the page. I was, I, I thought that piece of advice was very interesting. And I was also this kid, whatever his name is, uh, I found it interesting that he tried that advice for however long, he, a week or something like that. But it was pretty clear that when it, well, the week was over, he abandoned it. It's pretty clear that although he thought about it and tried it and noticed how it changed his writing, in the end, he decided, no, I want to write on my computer. I thought that was pretty fascinating. I, I wish I'd, if I'd known him, I would have asked a billion questions on that. Uh, Michael Lombardo says, since you're getting all the screeners, how about a Steve Summer movie stream? Someone, I don't think it was Mike, it wasn't you, Michael Lombardo. I, I don't think there's anybody in this stream. Somebody sent me a passionate and very convincing email on exactly that subject. I've been thinking about it a lot. Someone sent me a well reasoned, passionate email, a little too formal, 
a lot of you understand that when you're emailing me, you're emailing me. You're not emailing dear Mr. Donnie or anything like that. You're emailing a friend. Some people who are new to this channel don't realize that. So they, it was a, a, the email was a little more formal than I would have wanted, but it's really thought provoking. And this, that person made that point said, I've been faithfully watching your videos for a year now. And I have noticed that you often get advanced screeners. And I have noticed, I have looked back in some of your earlier videos and noticed that sometimes when you give a thumbnail impression of a video from an advanced screener, once the movie comes out and I end up watching it, I end up agreeing with you. So that is fascinating. I wish you would do something with that. You don't do anything with it. I wish you would do something with that. Person also made, also made the same point that a lot of people have made, that they really like the way I talk about movies. I don't quite understand that, but uh, a lot of people have emailed me and said, I really like the way you talk about movies. It's very old-fashioned. doesn't feel like the movie bros on YouTube at all. I certainly enjoy it, and I have a lot. I have a lot of screeners, a lot of them. Uh, the, it, it could easily happen, of course. You know, you've got this gigantic epic Dune thing, and I should be watching that and paying scrupulous attention to it to, you know, to give it the thought and consideration that it deserves. Since I've read the book, the book means an enormous amount to me. I've read the book a million times, but <laughs> the only one I've been watching over and over again is Black Demon, a giant shark movie. <laughs> Just, just Josh Lucas in the movie, just looking around in every scene, just clearly thinking. I kept waiting for him to say the line. I, he's so clearly thinking, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> so, uh, but I keep watching that instead of watching any of the things that I should be watching. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Matt Sheridan, yeah, Jeffrey's Little Tube. Yeah. I, it, it could very well be. It would be the first time that it's ever happened, but it could very well be that he has poisoned his own books for me from now on, that I simply cannot take this off as seriously, no matter what he does, which I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's my problem or his problem, but I, it could very well be. I'm going to try again. Uh, fortunately, I'm not commissioned to review the thing. Oh my God, what a nightmare that would be. Uh, Ravens fan, 1961. Oh, you're gone. Wait, where did you go? Uh, where, did you, where did you go? Uh, hello, Steve. Can you recommend a history of the late 18th century Boston? Thank you. Oh, that's a little out of left field. Ain't it? Not off the top of my head. Not devoted to that. The, there's the large chunk of that in that big history of Boston uh, that came out two years ago. Boston, a portrait of a city state or something like that. I don't remember the subtitle. But if you, if you, type, if you go to Amazon and type in Boston history, it'll be one of the first things that comes up. It's from a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And then there's a large chunk of it that in the time frame that you want is really good. Uh, Michael Lombardo, ah, Little Tubin makes a comeback. <laughs> yes, well, what would I think? What would happen if I read that book? What would I say about it? That parts of it are hard? <laughs> that, that it's effective in spurts? <laughs> that, that, that once I took it in hand, it really firmed up? What am I supposed to say about this thing? I don't know what even... <laughs> can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, uh, Evan Tucker, I, I come on for a lecture on writing 30 seconds ago, and you're talking about Jeffrey Tubin. Well, somebody brought him up. That's what happens on these Steve streams, if you're new to these Steve streams. I start out with a topic, and then it goes off the rails and to hell. <laughs> uh, Anthony Rucher says, I just read Richard Francis Burton's book on his pilgrimage to Mecca. What book of his do you think is his best? I might put that one there. I might put that one as best. I'm, I'm in the, the minority among people who read him and that I don't particularly like him. Uh, but I remember that one very vividly. Uh, Evan Tucker, Jeffrey Tubin should get a daily show on CNN. Everyone will tune in to see if this is the day he does it again. I asked at the time, how can anyone think about anything else while he's talking about anything? How can they do it? And I still don't have an answer to that. Uh, Jeffrey Clark. AI would be more coherent than Cormac McCarthy, just saying. Yeah, Cormac McCarthy's... The more stylized you are, I think the more invulnerable you are to AI, but he is stylized to the point of caricature. I bet an AI could do convincing Cormac McCarthy. Uh, Aaron says, prize yourself off your own thumb. Yes, well, it'd be nice if the spammer neighbor would do it. We haven't heard from him in a little bit. Maybe he's at it right now. 
Uh, J. Scott Phillips, good heavens. Did I just waste the last 45 minutes watching new Steve videos while there's been a live stream? <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm afraid I bombard the airwaves. <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect reminder of what an old friend of mine said when I talked about, uh, I think the thing that came up was that I had 12,000 subscribers at the time. We were talking about that and how utterly unlikely it is since I don't have any visuals, no videos, no editing, no nothing like that, no calls to action. I've never asked anybody to subscribe to this channel. Uh, we were talking about that and we were mentioning 12,000 subscribers. I think that's what we were talking about. And he looked at me and said, they know you still outnumber them, right? <laughs> so, and this is today's a perfect example where you've got more Steve content than you can possibly watch. Uh, Aaron, I don't trust authors' accounts of their own creative processes. I generally distrust people's accounts of their own thinking. Uh, Matt Sheridan, let's do a summer movie stream. I'll be the first bro pest in the chat. Well, I don't know about a stream, but I could do videos for the summer. Steve goes to the movies for the summer. That is That would definitely work. But would that be another channel? Would I do another channel for that? Just make another channel? Uh, uh, Michael Lombardo, I've seen her photo on the book jacket, but has anyone actually met Colleen Hoover? Or is she our first AI author? Many people have suggested that she is AI. I don't know if she is or not. The photo looks like AI. Uh, I've never met her. <laughs> uh, Matt Sheridan, Steve, what are your thoughts on Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? Uh, this is... a the Passion of the Christ is another of the very small number of things on which Christopher Hitchens and I agree completely. It's an abomination. In almost every level, it's an abomination. And no, on every level, it's an abomination. Uh, let's see here. Michael Mullins, I'm all for trying different writer's routines. You never know what's going to take your writing to the next level. I agree completely. I wish I could remember the name of the kid's channel. I'd shout him out. I, I can't remember. The, he, he does regular videos. He, he And they're all about writing. And he did a video where he was very clever. He took the uh, the author photo of Neil Gaiman and then posed in that same position and a, with a split screen for the thumbnail. It was a very good thumbnail. It was a very good video. I just can't remember his name to, to recommend him. And if I leave the stream, I will miss the brilliance and wisdom that is the Spaminator. <laughs> uh, uh, Eric Zielinski says, hi, Steve. I've re uh, recently read. Oh, where'd you go? Here'd you go. I recently read a good chunk of D.H. Lawrence for the first time. Thoughts on D.H. Lawrence as a writer, like, dislike, haven't yet seen him mentioned. I love the channel. Thank you. I don't particularly like him as a writer. His uh, deadline nonfiction that had editorial hands on it, I can definitely read. I just I was just handling a book of that, a big book of his nonfiction uh, earlier this morning when I was looking for something that I, of course, couldn't find. Uh, but his fiction, ugh, never done anything for me at all. None of it has. And I I don't know. Sometimes I, I feel guilty about that. Other times I think, how many chances have you given Lady Chatters as a lover? It's just a mess of a book. I, how many chances have you given it to see what some other people claim to see in it? If, if I'd read it once or twice, then maybe I'd think, you know, he'd be a question mark in my mind. And I think I've got to come back to this. But uh, he's not a question mark in my mind. I hate to say that, but I, he is not. Uh, Gandhi Angle says, wait, what about a fashion review? You can start with Matt, with the Met Ball. <laughs> Michael Mullins, Passion of the Christ equals Braveheart Part 2. Uh, well, okay, well, there's a little more going on there than that, but, but if it is Braveheart Part 2, then, uh, instead of the enemy being the English, the enemy is the Jews. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure that I prefer it. I'm not a big fan of Braveheart either, though. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, from this point forward, I declare that SFF shall now be referred to as FTF, Fantasy Technical Fiction. Oh, I don't think that's going to catch on. We're in enough trouble as it is with nomenclature without you adding an extra one. Uh, book songs and other magic. Talking of films, as you read and review a lot of nonfiction, it would be interesting to see your thoughts on documentary films. I have a documentary screener. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, my friend sends them to me, but she knows that she knows that I'm mostly going to watch non-documentary stuff. She sent me a doc. A, 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 oh, what was the subject of it? it some sort of social sciences subject that just bored the, the crap out of me just to read the title. When it, it's certainly not going to win against Black Demon I mean, against watching Black Demon over and over again, <laughs> a giant angry shark. 
Uh, Matt Sheridan, your first film of the summer should be Sam Raimi's The Quick and the Dead. That movie is a ludicrous hoot. Would I be doing older movies for Steve Ghost of the Movies? I don't know. But I couldn't agree more with your description. Ludicrous hoot is perfect. That is a perfect description. <laughs> when, as soon as this rain stops, I'm going to make an example out of you. <laughs> it is it is wonderful. The quick, if you have not seen The Quick and the Dead, it, it is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. A classic Gene Hackman performance. Just classic. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Michael Lombardo, I want to read a Jeffrey Tubin book about Anthony Weiner. That would be awesome. <laughs> You're not helping. Uh, Jared Henderson is back. How do you know when to abandon a writing project and pursue another instead? Well, the writing project that I was just doing about uh, two cops, the fantasy that I was pantsing, uh, I didn't know when to abandon that. Instead, a very gentle voice on Voxer told me, drop it. <laughs> it's just squashed it like a bug. Uh, otherwise, well, it's a long conversation, isn't it? But how you know whether or not to abandon it. It's a long writing conversation that perhaps we should have. I don't know where Jared Henderson lives. I'm presuming, since he's a man with a beard talking about philosophy, that he lives somewhere in the upper northwest of the west coast. Uh, but a plane trip to, to Hyde Cottage, other people do it. You could do it. We could have a long talk on the subject. Uh, it's tricky. Very tricky. And it's also a subject that I view as an outsider. Because 99% of the writing that I have done in my life has been done as a package deal on a deadline for money that I've already been paid. Or that somebody else has already been paid. So the, there hasn't been an option of abandoning it. And the same thing is true with the, the writing that I do voluntarily, the fiction writing that I do for NaNoWriMo that I've been doing for years now. Uh, I Once I started, I don't abandon that project. The, the, the nightmare scenarios with NaNoWriMo has been that I get to 10 minutes to midnight and suddenly abandon the project then. But this, that's before I've done any writing. Once I start, I finish. Uh, Blue Lady Orion, Aaron Ra was in Boston this last weekend. Yes, he was. He was at a Satanist convention that had tons and tons of uh, counter-protesters. Uh, if, if, if I didn't want to seem like a crazy stalker, but I would, I would love to talk to him, especially since he's now a rather exuberant dog lover, which is wonderful. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. It's uh, but I, even if I had been tempted, I mean, the, he and the convention and all of the counter protesters were right in the area of my library the, and my post office. There were, there were things that I could have done there. I could have manufactured errands so that it wasn't a total waste of time. And so that I wouldn't feel like a stalker, but I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known what to do anyway. I think probably what I would most have liked to do if I had done that, if I'd gone and actually met him would have been in, to invite him to do a zoom call with me. That would be a lot of fun. He's written a book, two of them. Uh, but, yeah, he was in Boston, and there was some phone footage that came of it. Uh, Matthew just says, was the YouTuber Jed Hearn? Uh, the, the young writer? That, wasn't, that isn't ringing a bell, but I'm, I'm not sure that it would ring a bell. That, but that's the thumbnail that I'm thinking of. Neil Gaiman on one side, him on the other. No one else has that thumbnail. So whoever does that, I, if you just type in Neil Gaiman writing routine he'd probably come up. I'd check it myself, but I, I can't. So, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, the Spaminator's back. Second rate Lex Luthor. You've misspelled Luthor. Okay. Uh, he doesn't even have a curly mustache. He is clearly inferior villain. I got your thumb right here. You baldy love fangirl. <laughs> uh, Aaron Huck says Gene Hagman once got fired from a theater company because the other supposedly didn't think he was actually acting. Well, Gene Hackman has, there's a narrative for him. I don't know how much of it is true. I've never met the man. Uh, there's a narrative for him that, that yeah, he's mostly just being himself and that he is, was before a major heart attack, a heart attack that he practically had to be built up from the molecular level to save him. Uh, that before that, the, the, his effectiveness at playing just horrible, acidic a-holes wasn't really acting. I don't know if that's true. But uh, the perform it's always delightful to watch. His performance in The Quick and the Dead is great. Uh, 
Jared Henderson's back. I'm even more insufferable than that. I live in Austin. Oh, I should have known. My old home. I should have known. Oh, <laughs> goodness. Well, that is a long way away. Fortunately, we have technology to help us. A couple of writing videos. The main thing I was worried about when we did our little confab uh, on on uh, my channel is that I would it would it would increase my subscriber number, which I'm the only person on the platform. I don't want any more subscribers. I have plenty of subscribers. I, I, have, a, I have a great group plus the spaminator. <laughs> so I don't need I don't need more mouths to feed. There's a stack of books on the shelf over there to be mailed out. Uh, I was worried that because you're following your your subscriber count is enormous. I was worried that there would be bleed through. I'm guessing that you're a man of your word. You must have just not told anybody about it because otherwise I would think that even the a nominal bleed through would have doubled my subscriber count. So I was worried about that, and that didn't happen. So the ground is cleared for a whole bunch of discussions. We could talk for an hour about writing alone, just about writing. We could talk for an hour about Austin. <laughs> So many conversations to have. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, is Jeffrey Tubin, uh, Tubin's new biography pop-up book? Oh, my God, you people aren't helping at all. Uh, uh, Gandhi Angle says, will you be rising early to watch the coronation? Rising early? Are you mistaking me for one of you people that looks longingly at your pillow and turns into a drooling blob for 10 hours every out of every 24. <laughs> I will be watching the coronation. I wouldn't miss it for all the mud in Egypt. I wouldn't miss it. The coronation of a king of England, I wouldn't miss it. Uh, but I won't need to rise early to do it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Aaron, Steve, is your offer to be a writing accountability buddy serious? I'll take you up on that. Well, I don't know the shape of the offer. I think the shape of the offer is is connected with the original subject of this Steve stream, which is what do I do about all this? What do I what do I do? I'm feeling restless within the confines of how I usually think about writing. I want to be more active. I want it to be more communal, and I also want it to be more public. The price tag attached and everything. Talk about accountability. I just don't know. Uh, I just I don't know. <sighs> Uh, book songs, not the magic. Steve, are you taking part in horror mayhem? Can't remember if you've announced your involvement. Uh, I am taking part. Yeah, I haven't. I don't think I've done a horror mayhem video yet. It's the fifth of May, so I probably should. I probably should probably put that on the roster of videos for tomorrow. But I am taking part. Yeah. Uh, Michael Mullins, uh, learning to tell a basic story and analyzing the likes of Matthiasen, Pynchon, et al. Oh, back to the subject. Any chance for advanced author tube videos? Most. YT videos are about basic writing techniques. There's a difference between learning to tell a basic story and analyzing the likes of, well, I don't know. I don't know what level I would even do that on. I don't make regular author tube videos, and I really think I should. Uh, I guess they would probably be all over the map. Uh, uh, Gandhi Angle says, love Gene Hackman, notably in the French connection. Oh, my God. You, God. <laughs> Pick any other movie. Please pick any other movie. Uh, Matt Sheridan, Gene Hackman is phenomenal. I agree. Gene Hackman is phenomenal. Uh, James Holder, it is Jed Hearn who did the Neil. Oh, then Jed Hearn must be the person because there can't be two people. It, it, Jed Hearn. That's a, I'm surprised I didn't remember that name. That's fairly memorable. Young kid, entirely unconvincing facial hair, <laughs> the black hair. That is that. Does that seem right? Uh, uh, Matt Sheridan, Sharon Stone is the only one in The Quick and the Dead that's not in on the joke. Are we sure about that? I've often heard that said, but are we, I don't know why The Quick and the Dead keeps coming up on the Steve Stream, but are we sure about that? I, I've heard people say she's going for an Oscar and she doesn't realize how ridiculous that is. And I've heard other people say, no, no. The scene in the in the graveyard in the rain when they're running at each other, firing weapons and screaming, Surely that scene can't be done straight. Surely she had to know. You can't. Surely she had to know. <laughs> if, if you, even if she goes to that scene, you can't do that. That scene gives away the whole movie. She can't have shot that scene and not known. I'm, I don't know. Uh, D Temple 54. What about D Temple 54? I don't think that name has come up before. And Tim Skinner appears to be gone. There was a Mosasaur in his in his title name. Uh, what about streams on regional fiction, Southern New England, etc.? <laughs> Not a chance. Uh, Gandhi Angles, how many hours do you sleep? You're up late reading slash writing. I believe Charles will be crowned at seven Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I don't sleep much. I sleep far, far less than the rest of you do. Far, far less. 
uh, to, to the extent where there is a huge body of study on me at Mass General. I sleep far less than the rest of you do. I will not have any trouble uh, watching the coronation, and I wouldn't miss it. It's genuine history. I wouldn't miss it. Uh, Matt Sheridan, Hitchens once called Charles a witless dolphin. That always makes me laughing. Now, Hitchens had a problem with Charles, a large problem with him that I, <laughs> I say. Uh, uh, Matt Sheridan, I think Sharon Stone was looking for an Oscar nominee. Well, you all right, so you're in that crowd. I've, I've known people on both sides of this issue. Uh, th where she's the only one taking it seriously. She's the only one who is who is trying to make this, you know, a Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, uh, her and DiCaprio are not in on the joke, and they are the worst in the film because of it. Okay. Boy, I just can't. You could be right. But DiCaprio's never in on any joke. But, I, but I, you could be right about Sharon Stone. I just, I can't imagine it. But it, you, it could... It, the movie bears either interpretation. Uh, Aaron, what did you think of the Arthur Two people I recommended? Ellen Brock, Jane Combs, David Stewart. I'm not sure that I watched them. I had a lot of Arthur Two recommendations, a lot of them. I didn't watch. I didn't watch, but a fraction of them. I should probably watch the pointed recommendations rather than do the kind of random exploration that I was doing because the random exploration is not turning up the best side of author two, not at all. <laughs> so maybe I should. Uh, Gandhi Angle says, I tried reading Spare, couldn't do it. Yeah, well, I read the whole thing, but I wish I hadn't. Uh, Matt Sheridan said, is Harry going to watch the coronation? I don't know. It won't be up to him. It'll be up to his wife. I'd be willing to bet. Yeah. Uh, Jenny Parks, Kate Cavanaugh has done about a dozen different famous writing routines. Fascinating to see and compare them. Kate Cavanaugh. Okay, I'll remember that. Uh, James Holder, I'm not seeing any facial hair on Jed, but he does have a video where he does the same pose as Guyman in the thumbnail. Maybe more than one person's done it. It is an inviting idea. Maybe more than one person has. I, I don't know, and I can't check. This live stream has to end anyway. My computer tells me that we've been doing this for almost two hours, which is not 10 past the hour. So this, I will, this live stream will have to end anyway, and then I can go and check. <gasps> Excuse me. And also do some work. <laughs> I've, got to do, I've got to do some work before I read for the night. Uh, so let's do a few final comments before we wrap this Steve stream up. You've been wonderful company. I don't know. I don't know that you could have been much help on a lot of the subjects that I opened with. A lot of the questions that I opened with, I probably just need to do more thinking about. You can count on them coming up again on another Steve stream. What do I do and how do I do it? I'm gathering not a lot of people in this chat have actually self-published. And I, those are the people I really kind of need to talk to. Or maybe I'll just watch a bunch of uh, insufferable YouTube videos on the subject. Uh, uh, James Holder. I am not seeing any facial hair on Jed, but he does have a video where he does the same pose as Guyman in the thumbnail. Uh, uh, Aaron says, I, am I the only one who thinks Guyman is insufferably pompous? No, you are not the only one. Uh, Gandhi Angles. Do you think the writer's strike will linger? Yes, I do. Uh, Jenny Parks, 1.48 a.m. Oops, I have to get up for work soon. Oh, go to bed. Good Lord, it's 2 in the morning. Uh, Aaron says, I have. Uh, I don't remember what that was about because we're doing a lightning round wrap-up here to wrap up this Steve stream. That reading guy, the next Steve stream better be soon. <laughs> You're a very threatening presence, aren't you? <laughs> you need to come over here for Wine and Calzones and calm down a little. Yes, the next Steve stream will be very soon. Could it even be tomorrow? <laughs> Uh, Dylan M. It's been pleasures tonight, Steve. Thank you for the stream. Have a good evening. You too. Finally, somebody gets the hints I've been dropping that this thing needs to wrap up. We need to get this horse back to the barn. Uh, N. Paris. Good night, Steve. I'm really looking forward to, into your further forays into AuthorTube. I think I originally found your channel through an old writing video of yours, so I'm excited for more. I should do more writing videos. Aaron says, I know self-publishing well. Well, I need to know it well. I I want books out there in the world. I it's tempting to think about some sort of GoFundMe where you're all involved and that's it. But I kind of want books to be out there in the world where anybody can find them and decide whether or not they want to pay for them. Uh, Michael Lombardo, have you watched Oppenheimer? You're starting new topics, but we are wrapping up the Steve stream. There will be another one. Uh, Gandhi Angle says, "Love the live stream." Well, I should hope so. Uh, Jared Anderson is here. Thanks, Steve. Enjoy your evening. I will. I look forward to hearing from you and your people about writing. 
Michael Mullins, thank you. Always a pleasure. Gola Muadib, good stream. All the best for your writing. That reading guy, I'd fuss over Frida the whole time. Yes, he's right here. My little baby's right there. <laughs> Sound asleep. Well, Master of Bedtime. Uh, uh, Jenny Park says, good night, everyone. Time to grab some sleep. I should say so. Uh, J. Scott Phillips, I'll be in Boston next week. Maybe we'll do a video together. Uh, Matt Sheridan, good night, everyone. I got to attend my pizza. Aaron says, Steve, would you like to discuss self-publishing? I would, yes. I'm not sure that I know what I want to discuss about it yet. But I, I know that, that this change is real. I've been, I've been living with it for a week now, and it's definitely not going anywhere. That writing these things and just feeling the sort of out there nebulous community of NaNoWriMo is no longer enough. I want to publish work for money. I want to publish work for an audience and see what they think. Uh, I want to do that, and I shouldn't let any more time go. I, the books, the self-published stuff that I see every day, <laughs> a huge amount of it is Hogswill, and it's out there in the world. You can find it on Amazon. <laughs> so, if, and if those people can figure out how to do it and do it and get it to look professional, whether it's got good content or not, then I can. I, I'm wonder, getting back to the point I was making, you know, two hours ago. I'm wondering if it just means if what it comes down to is a stake of money. Is that what I need? A stake of money? Do I need a sum of money to start off with until the thing starts sustaining itself? I don't know that. I have no idea about the, how this works. Uh, the Spaminator, whatever. Guess I'll go shave my head now like Lex the, <laughs> the mustache stays. That reading guy, I want to read Steve's book on the Trojan War. Yes, Troy War is would be high on my list of things to self-publish. Uh, Michael Mullins, self-publishing non-genre serious literary fiction is an interesting topic. Books, songs, and other magic. I did a video recently as a response video about how much self-publishing can cost. It can be cheap. Yeah, well, I'd want to. I'd want to know all about that. I'd want it to be cheap. I, ideally, I'd want it to be cheap and not look cheap, but I guess everybody does <laughs> that. Uh, Aaron, I've read your story in that horror anthology. You could write saleable fiction. The Cold Traps. Did you like it? Well, that's nice to hear. Uh, Michael Lombardo, thanks for all the extra comic book videos. Yes, I, I'm on such a roll that I'm actually tempted to just keep doing it <laughs> when it's virtually an act of aggression against my viewers. They hate the videos so much. Nobody watches them. I'm actually tempted to just keep going because there's so much to talk about. Even if David Wiley and I do an X-Men video every Monday, even if Michael K. Vaughn and I continue to do a comic video every Wednesday, there's still so much to talk about. Uh, but anyway, uh, book songs and other magic. I've self-published six works so far and it's been a learning curve. That's, that's exactly what's on my mind. That learning curve for myself. It's exactly what I'm thinking about. But, and this is that is great. I wish we had, we could have started with all these things, but we got a lot of ground covered anyway. We talked for a long time about the quick and the dead. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. I want to thank you all for for uh, for joining in here for for joining me. This went way way long, but it's not going to stop me uh, from doing another one. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for tonight. Thank you all for joining me and I will uh uh what's going on here what's going on with the whole with the, uh, yeah there we go uh I will I will wrap this up for now but I will be back I will have a lot more to talk about next time could even be tomorrow <laughs> so maybe I'll see you all then in the meantime have a good night and thank you all enjoy the coronation <laughs>